Upper Body Anatomy 101. So we're going to be going through everything from basically the pelvis on up, including the pelvis that was in lower body. And this is just one-on-one, -on -one, 101. So think surface level um, basics. And, uh, and we won't get too into the nitty gritty, but enough to hopefully make sure, I'm going to hit my share settings, um, share screen, that, uh, that you walk away with a good understanding of what's a program for a client based on what you know about the upper body. And that's probably the biggest thing, right? So let's dive into it. First thing is we've got the cervical spine uh, all the way at the top. That is what connects basically your cranium on down. So it's anything in that green area. Then we've got our thoracic spine and you'll hear a lot. We call it the T-spine. Right, so we talk about T spine rotation. We talk about T spine thoracic or, or T spine reach. It's any of these things within this section of the spine that is connected to the rib cage. And notice the shoulder blades, the scapula, sit on there. So it is the most important aspect where we're looking to get as much rotation out of as possible. Right, and we'll go in more in depth. You've got the five vertebrae that are for the lumbar spine, that lower aspect of the spine. And this is where oftentimes it'll be like, oh yeah, my low back hurts. A lot of times this is what clients are referring to. Um, or if somebody's like, oh yeah, I blew out my L4, L5, S1, right? It's that fourth lumbar vertebrae, right? So this guy right here where my mouse is, this one would be number five. And then this would be your sacral number one, right? So down to this base piece, you've got your sacrum, right? They're almost fused together there. And then you've got your coccyx, which basically if you ever heard somebody say, I broke my tailbone, that's what they're talking about, right? Landed on that little guy there and it just cracked hurt, right? So within this, when we're mostly looking at the spine, we're not gonna be dealing with cervical within this one-on-one uh, -on -one type lecture here. We're dealing with the rest, right? So from um, the lumbar section up on into the thoracic section, right? So anytime you hear somebody talking about their thorax, right? They're talking about this front side, like of their sternum, basically when, when they're using that terminology. So when we look at the vertebrae themselves, the lumbar spine, uh, aspects. They're bigger in nature. We're not going to go into the facets and, you know, that they're, it's almost like an onion on the inside where you can peel back layers. Um, but basically they, they sit pretty flat, right? And so they become more and more concave with how they sit at the higher you kind of go. And that's why we have so much more mobility that happens from our lumbar spine. I mean, I'm sorry, forgive me, our thoracic spine as opposed to our lumbar spine. There's not as much space here and they're pretty flat. So oftentimes when you hear of somebody saying like, I threw out my back, I blew out a disc, um, I herniated a disc, whatever the case may be, it's usually lower part of the back. And it usually comes from this lumbar that somebody goes into flexion and then rotation. And then what ends up happening, right? I'll, I'm going to exaggerate it, but you've got two discs sitting up on top of each other. And so we go into flexion, we squeeze pretty tight here, and then we go into rotation and then it leaves pretty sharp position here. And so this disc goes and shoots on out any of the fluid or any of the space in between. Like that's where stuff is kind of happening and getting to be problematic. And so what we want to do as coaches and personal trainers is stabilize as much of that as we possibly can to avoid those things from happening, right? And so we're going to work on a lot of the musculature and understanding of that, but also then giving our clients back a lot of this thoracic spine mobility is going to be a crucial piece for us, right? Because you can see how this curvature is natural, but if it becomes pronounced in any way, pronounced in the lower back, then we might have this like position of chest being too far open. We'll talk about that being a position of inhalation later or too collapsed, right? Too much kyphosis. And then the head ends up in this position, horrible for breathing. You can even hear how it changes by breathing without even trying. And so we just want to be aware of what that's doing and how it's changing, manipulating the rib cage, rib cage as well as we are going there, right? So easiest kind of understanding of this, I look at it as like a tent, right? It's called the tent model of the spine. And so if you look at this old school style of tent, Imagine this entire top piece being your spine. And so we have at the very apex, the very front corner, that is going to be your top post. That top post is going to be your thoracic spine and the bottom post is going to be your lumbar spine. So if we were to literally use these lines right here to divide the two on up, you've got your top post, which is going to be the top part of your thoracic spine. You got this bottom post, the bottom part of your lumbar spine connected to your pelvis, connecting up into your neck, right? Because those, and then the tent runs all along here. Hence the reason it has, whoops, wrong way, has that curvature, right? Like it's, it's natural. And so what we want to look at from a training standpoint are the different posts that are holding 
this spine into place. So if you think about like when you've ever been camping, you can put one tent post into some nice solid ground and it's going to be a little further out than maybe the other one. The other one may be a little bit shorter with where it's distance. Then you go on this side, same thing, a little shorter. And this one, unfortunately, has to be really far back and anchored into a kind of a weird spot. But they're creating this cross ability, right, to lock that tent on in. And so basically what we're trying to do is use the musculature that is coming from all different angles into the spine to stabilize the spine. Like that's what a lot of this musculature's ultimate function is, right? Their action, rem reminder, action is basically just to move a joint towards the body, right? It is movement and function is more on the stabilization side is trying to stabilize or resist some form of force, right? That's the definition of stability. And so that's what a lot of these different muscles are doing, AKA different tent posts. And so we wanna make sure that they're functioning at the best possible ways. So when we look at the vertical posts and imagine vertical post here, vertical post right back here, right? They are mostly gonna be the erectors and the transverse spinal lats. And so they are the erectors. I think it's just good to note, like you ever see somebody with big meaty erectors? Um, it just looks, you can actually see them sticking on up straight on through, or sometimes you can even feel um, this, this aspect here, even though they sit underneath, like you can definitely feel them. And it's just crucial to note that a lot of people think any of those things, like they're designed to extend your spine, but they're really not. Their, their main goal is to keep you from going into flexion or extra um, flexion, right? And so it's just kind of good to note on that regard. So let's talk about which one of those four pegs that we're kind of looking at. Well, we've got the lats. So we've got these guys right in here, right along the side, because this is a, a surface level of muscles and this is the internal level of muscles that we're looking at. So we've got the lats on both sides. So you can see those muscle fibers are coming down at an angle into... Um, into the spine. We'll talk about that in a minute. It's not really into the spine. Um, and then you look at the glutes, glute max, right? So now if you look at the glutes, there are these big muscles on the bottom, also fan-shaped, your biggest muscles in your body that come up and uh, counter. So you've got tent post, you've got tent post. Oh, perfect. They're contradicting each other with where they're at, but they're going directly into the spine. Again, I'm using that because nothing goes directly in. But um, then we've got the transverse abdominis, right? So all along the side that is stabling, uh, stabilizing us. And then our internal obliques, which we, so we have the external obliques, which allow us to flex. And then the internal obliques, which allow us to flex, but from the opposite side, because they're basically going that direction, that direction. But when they're actually mixed in muscle fibers, they're overlaying. And so one is helping us make sure we don't overextend while the other the other one is helping us extend um, and vice versa with flex. So we've got these four different tent posts that are really just keeping us uh, stable, right? Through, through the entire human body uh, to make sure that that spine isn't shifting. And I think it's really important to note that the lat on the right, the glute on the left, they're almost muscle fibers going in the same direction. And so we do a lot of movements. We program a lot of movements where it may be like a landmine. And I've got that landmine in my right hand, but I've got my left leg forward so that I am forced to use that left glute as I press through, right? And so I'm getting this length that is happening, but it's also lat into glute on that backside that's stabilizing, but it's allowing that rotation to happen. Right. And then your other side is just trying to function to keep you locked in um, and, and to keep you from overly rotating or causing you to rotate through your spine. So hopefully that makes it a nice simple to understand that cross pattern. And you see that so often in so many different aspects of the body. And that's why we're able to run and walk the way that we are. When your right arm is propelling forward, your left leg is propelling forward and vice versa. So the arms are going here to contract through one aspect and flex one aspect while the other aspect is extending. And so it's constantly these cross muscle fibers that are engaging to keep our center of mass body over our center of gravity, right? And allowing us to move through propulsion as we go. So. Let's talk about the thoracolumbar fascia. So it's this giant white section here that runs all along the spine. And it's really this fascia is what connects actually to your spine. And so although 
we can't manipulate it very much. It's very hard to change. We can change and manipulate everything that is around it. And the main thing that is around it is your lat, right? And so your lat is a massive, massive piece that is here. And it's going into this thoracolumbar fascia. And so ultimately, as the low back gets fatigued, we can't rely on what's not there. So we can't rely on thoracolumbar fascia, which is not a muscle, right? It's just hanging on. We can't rely on that to do anything to stabilize us, to pull us into place. And so this is why we need to focus on the musculature that is around it to stabilize and better our spine. Because it's kind of like when you bite your cheek, right? Or you sprain your ankle. It's just like you can't stop spraining your ankle. I don't know if this has ever happened to you, but I sprained my ankle 10 years ago and I still find myself spraining my ankle. Bite the inside of your cheek. Well, you just have to shift and eat on the other side because you're going to, no matter what, continue to bite that cheek. It's that piece is going to be there until it is actually completely healed on up. And so once we have created some damage to our, you know, low back and, and it caused some pain, right? We need to actually find other ways to stabilize. And this is where training the lat can be such an important thing or the glute or, you know, the the, uh, the hip flexors. And we'll, we'll talk about all of those things there, right? Um, but you can see here, the, the muscle fiber orientation comes so down on in and really grabs on to that aspect. And so if you think about the body going into flexion, right? Like we are flexing at our spine and coming over. It is all of this thoracolumbar fascia that is trying to hold our spine as stable as possible as we go down and not have it just collapse. Now, when you're doing an RDL, when you're doing a hinge, when you're doing a deadlift, any of these patterns where, move my computer a little bit, but where you're hinging at the hips, people say like, oh, you need to keep a flat back. Muse flash. So we actually like during testing um, under the best, what looks like to our eye, extremely flat, can actually have anywhere from eight to 20 degrees of actual change in the disposition. Like that much difference is massive and we may not be able to see it from the eye. And so if that's just happening with someone that looks perfect, imagine someone that is actually really struggling with this movement pattern. And so this is why it becomes such an interesting conversation of looking at the muscle fibers, where they're coming down, so we know what to train and what to not train and how much to do, right? And so we'll get into that in a second. So good, just anatomy upper body. Going into some core musculature, um, probably the key thing to kind of note is your main focus, your body's main focus of all of your core musculature is to do one thing and that's to just protect your internal organs. So anybody that comes to me and is like, Joseph, I don't have any core. Like I have zero core, zero abs. I get they're being a little sarcastic. They may actually not be. Um, but my response is always like, yeah, well then how are your intestines and stuff staying inside? Because let's go back and let's look right at this image. So we have spine, we got a ton of ribs, right? All around where our most vital organs tend to be, our heart and our lungs. If our heart gets smashed or we get, you know, stabbed in the lungs, even if we get punched, right? It could cause permanent damage. But that's why we have this rib cage. That is, we want that to break and flex and do whatever it needs to do to protect us. It's the same reason we have this massive skull. It's the same reason we have this pelvis that is sitting around our reproductive organs down there as much as possible. So you're gonna hit into hip bone likely before you're going to damage anything else within that structure, right? So you think about those vital most places, but we don't have anything down in this aspect at all other than muscle. Muscle is the only really thing, real thing that is surrounding every little aspect of that body to keep it in place, right? Um, and that is so that we can actually move as effectively as possible. It is essential. And so that's what we just need to remember is that our, our core musculature, its main job is to protect our internal organs. So yes, you may be like, well, I don't need to train core. I do heavy lifts. Eh, you probably still do, right? For a lot of other reasons, like stabilizing your lumbar spine. Um, but you also may find somebody that's just like, I just want to train core, 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 core. And I'm like, cool, let's actually pick up something heavy so we can do what it's meant to do in that regard as well, right? So go to just some of the core musculature. So we got rectus abdominis, which is just your abs. So easiest way to think about it, right? You've got your quad, which is your rectum, your rectus 
femoris. So we've got rectus abdominis, right? It just means it's going vertical, right? Um, and yes, it is the, the nice little six there, which makes the six pack. And then you've got your longer aspect of your rect band that sits down, or rectus abdominis sits down here, which is why some people can claim they have an eight pack, right? <clears throat> Um, but what is his main job? It's to flex the spine. Its job is to collapse you down on in. So we do want to train these muscles through spinal flexion. That is their main job. We want them to do what they're supposed to do so that our body doesn't freak out, seize up, and then think it needs to actually just use our lower back. Right. And so for a long time, it became this whole thing of like, well, don't do any sit ups, don't do any crunches. They're horrible for you. You know, they, people would use a credit card as an analogy, right? They would take a card. They'd be like, well, this is your back um, and you're going to just do this, you know, with all these crunches. And then eventually one day you're going to be like, oh my gosh, no, that's not how this works. Your back is not going to just snap in half like a credit card that gets overly bent, right? So we're, we, we're not going to be team only planks and team only band pull off presses, right? Those are great exercises, phenomenal exercises, but you can only progress them to a certain degree. And we want to continue to make the core stronger and stronger and stronger in its entirety. So we do need to actually do variations of core flexion exercises. It's actually good because its main secondary job, if you get them nice and strong through this aspect, is spinal anti-extension. So if they're super strong, then when I go back to catch a ball, right, or I go back to reach for something behind me, like in a compartment or reaching back to get my kids, I'm not going to like lock up my lower back or go too far and psh, rupture a disc in that regard because my abs are actually able to stabilize my spinal extension, right? So then we've got the transverse abdominis. So psh, transverse abdominis running through the aspects of the side there. And they're crucial with how they wrap around and create this extra tight barrier for us that ensures we can actually get some rotation, hence the name transverse, transverse plane, right? Like that is their goal, is to allow us that movement and allow us to make sure that we are going to stay extremely stable through the spine through rotation, right? So they're absolutely critical. We've got our external obliques. Um, is there external, here you go. This is a good example. So you can see like the top version here, your external obliques, they're coming down at this angle. They actually are interweaving up there at the top with serratus. Um, we'll touch on that in a little bit, just with how they connect to the rib gauge and how important that is when we get into serratus. And then you've got your internal obliques and notice they're the opposite muscle fibers. Like they're going against each other in that regard. And so if you think about it, the um, muscles that are on one side are going to be the opposite on the other side to do the same thing. So my external obliques on my left side here, I'm marrying you, but then my internal obliques on my right side are going to help me laterally bend towards my left. Whereas on the opposite, right, it's going to help me go the other direction, which just means it also allows me with slight twisting, but also not twisting and not bending, right? So the internal of the same side is going to help me from going too far, just like the oblique on the opposite side of the external side is going to do the opposite there, right? So it's just a beautiful genius system that the human body has to create this cross pattern to ensure we can rotate and rotate extremely well, but not overly rotate. And so this is why we need to train through rotation, but we need to train through anti-rotation as well. And we also then need to train under heavy load to make sure like doing farmer's carries or things of that nature where it wants to twist us and pull us because that's our internal obliques and our transverse abdominis working really hard to create spinal stabilization. So I can't reiterate that enough. Last thing you want is your client that's carrying groceries to throw out their lumbar spine in some regard or, or cause some kind of hernia. Okay. And when we put all these together, and this is why I was doing that kind of cross uh, situation talking about it earlier, but it's called the oblique sling. So it's a line of musculature that runs from one shoulder contralateral to the side of your pelvis, right? And so you can see it best here. This person's running, right? We've got left sh shoulder forward um, as their right hand coming forward, as this right foot is coming forward. So you've got these opposites here and you've got the opposites that are going back into extension. And so we know that we've got all of these muscles, including the adductors on this side, working really, really hard to stabilize. So this is what the anterior oblique sling would look like. And then we've got what it would look like from the back, so the posterior side. And this is what I'm saying, those lats, those fibers almost match up with these 
glute fibers, right? Um, and so it's just beautiful to see the way that the human body lines up, which means we need to train from the side, from angles quite often, right? And so if you think about this external oblique is working really hard while this adductor is working really hard to stabilize the body while it is just trying to move forward. The quad here, the glute on the backside, the pumping of the arms, right? That the body is trying to move in propulsion, right? And so that is its main action that it is trying to achieve is going from here to here as fast as possible, which means then the function of the rest of my musculature is just trying to keep me balanced and keep me upright while I allow my body's main action to take place. And so we want to train those muscles from a function standpoint while we can train the other ones from an action standpoint. Meaning, this is why we would be like, all right, well, the oblique, let's, let me do a side plank. Great. Take it a step further. Think about the oblique sling. If we did a Copenhagen side plank, Copenhagen side plank would be, I've got my arm here. Let me see. I don't know if I can pull this off. Moving things around. Weird angle. You guys can do this with me. We can figure this out. So Copenhagen plank, right? I'm using my adductor to stabilize my lower aspect of my body comes all the way across the way that my musculature is working. So as it's working really hard to stabilize up into my spine and this oblique is firing quite heavily. So that's activating the entire oblique sling. Great example here. Another one would be Paul off, right? And much more simpler variation, but we're in a split stance. We're in a split stance where we've got the opposite leg forward. So now you can start to think like, oh, maybe this is why we do a lot of half kneeling positions. And we do the arm that is on the same side of the leg that is down and we get that crossover push because in essence, a lot of these things, right? If I'm half kneeling and I'm pushing through is going to allow a lot of that musculature to do its main function of stabilization through many different aspects of our body. So whether that's a band pull up, whether that's a landmine press, whether it's just an overhead press, right? Whatever these exercises are. Now I'm not only training a beautiful aspect of the body for hypertrophy and strength, through its action, I'm just trying to move this arm to this position and back, right? But now I'm training a lot deeper level of something else simultaneously, right? So if I land my client two days a week, I'm going to do a lot more of this than I am with a client that I've got four or five days a week. Hope that makes sense. Okay, so let's go with this guy here. Um, if you don't know who he is, you, you must be really young. That's okay. Uh, his name's Phil. Bill Heath, uh, one of the greatest bodybuilders that ever lived within the big boy category. Yes, he is on a lot of steroids, like as, as far as many as you can legally take. I don't even know. Um, but I like using an example of a really big, massive, shredded bodybuilder to help uh, with just muscles because it's just easier. <laughs> um, somebody that, uh, that doesn't work out as much or, you know, doesn't get shredded or doesn't take steroids, it's a little harder to see. So let's look at this guy, all right? See a ton of stuff here. Um, but what I want you to kind of focus on is imagine you were to draw a box right around his chest. Okay. So you got this imaginary box and we're looking at the anterior side, right? So if you really think about it, you see pecs, massive, massive, massive pecs, right? And they're, they're pretty like solid as far as like being one piece, and a lot of times people talk about like how you train the upper pack and the mid pack and the lower aspect, of the pack, right? That's great. But you really see one solid pack, okay? Yeah, you can see like, I see a little bit of like anterior delt, front delt, right? You see, I see the lats popping out, it's massive. But, but ultimately, this on the actual front side of his body, it's chest, so it's pack and it's delt, right? That is all that you can put within this box. Now, let's draw that same box on the back side. Woo, look at all the differences in muscles. And I think this is just really helpful to kind of understand the differences that we're dealing with here. And so you're like, all right, well, I got rear delt, I've got upper trap, I've got mid trap, I've got lower trap here. Um, you know, I've got uh, obviously major, major lats here. I've got right here, terrace uh, major. I've got infraspinatus here. You can see his rhomboids almost sticking out underneath to push up 
these lower aspects of the traps. Um, you may even be able to say you can see Terrace Minor up in there. Hard to say. Um, I guess it would come through there. Um, but yeah, you can see so much on the back because there's so many different muscles, right? And this is why oftentimes trainers talk about like, oh, you need to do a two to one pushing uh, pull to push ratio. Just meaning they're going to prescribe twice as many pulling exercises as they are pushing exercises. Now, I'm willing to bet if you actually asked the trainer that's recommending that or doing that thing, why they're going to just say, oh, because, you know, we slouch more, we sit more, we do everything from this regard. So we're doing this more. That's, that's exactly not why we um, do it. It's because literally we have an insane amount of differences for the muscles on this aspect of the body, right? Um, and so then, and what I mean by that is they move in different orientations. So for instance, look at this pec, right? If we do a dumbbell flat bench press, we are going to be targeting the pec. Again, it's one main muscle group. If we do an incline, we're still going to be hitting the pec. Maybe a little bit more delt, but we're still going to be hitting the pec. All right, let's go do a pec deck machine. We're still hitting that same pec. Now let's go do regular fly, still hitting that pec. Now let's, like, they all hit the pec, the pec, the muscle. All right, so let's go, let's do one exercise now. Let's do a dumbbell chest supported row. Cool. Let's keep our elbows fairly close to our body. We're hitting our lap right? We're pulling deep down in. Nice. Cool. Now let's flare the elbows a little bit. Oh, sweet. Now we're hitting the rhomboids, but we're not hitting the lat as much. Oh, interesting. So I'm just changing my arm position. Now let's come up a little bit higher. Oh yeah. Now we're definitely hitting like infraspinatus, teres major. This is great. Let's come up a little, a little bit more. Oh, now we're hitting our rear delts. Now let's come all the way up. Oh man. Now I'm just getting upper and mid trap, like 100% that's happening through here. That's one move. I change my angle of my arms. Yes, I may get a little bit more delt for my presses, but I'm still getting all peck. And so this is where the aspect of training chest versus training back, I think is just important to note as far as what does this human look like that I'm training? We won't go into this too, too much because this is going to be more of a level two situation. But when we look at the fact that this spine curves, right? And then our rib cage curves, we need our shoulder blades, our scapula to slide around the rib cage. Okay. And so just by changing our position that we are in, we can target different muscles within the back. Right By changing our arm position, we can do the same. By changing our incline of the bench, yes, you may work a little bit more fibers from a different aspect of the chest, but what is gonna change it even more than that is the fact that your rib cage is either gonna be one that is deep or one that is shallow. One that has a wide infrasternal angle, really broad in, inhalation, like you're stuck in this inhalation position. What's up, bro? What's up? I just like bench press all day, right? I'm, my lumbar is uh, shitty because it's always impinged and uh, my legs turn out and I have really bad knees, but I'm fine, right? Or one that is always stuck. I, mean, I don't know why these voices. Why are you, what are you listening to? Um, but that is stuck in exhalation. So it's like really narrow infrasternal angle, really shallow. So now let's think about this. You got somebody who's got really broad, big infrasternal angle and, and chest cavity, and they've got short arms. That bar doesn't have to go that far, but also their pec is already super stretched because it's coming around their actual rib cage right? Because the pec will insert, we'll get into this in a second, insert into the glenohumeral, uh, into the, sorry, dogs are barking, into the actual humerus, right? But ultimately, the wider I am, the less I need to actually bring back to get the stretch that I want to grow that muscle more. But if I have a really narrow chest cavity or really long arms, well, then I have to come down so far and so far back just to get that pec to get the same stretch to happen, right? And so a lot of it has to do with our rib cage more than anything else when it comes to targeting these muscles, okay?
But ultimately, this differentiation made um, some validity as to why we end up doing a lot of different poll variations and working on different different aspects. All right. So since we're talking a little bit about the rib cage and stuff, let's go through some bony landmarks more than anything else. They're not as many within like this aspect of the, the upper body as you can find. Like we were talking about, like you can easily find like the one on the side of your hip, like your greater trochanter on your actual femur, right? Um, there, there are ones though. So probably the, the most easy to find is going to be your sternoclavic, uh, sternoclavicular joint, like your SC joint. So it's the two little nodules here. It's the one that nobody likes when they put a barbell on it for front squats and they're like, oh, but it really hurts. And like, I'm like, choke yourself, get over it, right? Um, and so, so it's one of the strongest joints in the entire human body, right? And thankfully so, because this definitely, I mean, it connects your sternum to your clavicular SC joint, right? Like all these things are very simple. They make sense. A lot of times people freak out when it comes to anatomy. If you just like pull back, calm down, look at it, you're going to be okay. Um, but it, the SC joint itself is really, really rigid and stiff because we want to have an anchor point that allows our ribs to still move down here so that we can breathe, right? Allows our shoulder to move here. But we want to make sure that this doesn't break, doesn't have any issues because if it did, oh no, now my ribs all fell out. Now my heart fell out. That's kind of problematic. Um, I'm being dramatic, but ultimately, like if anybody does actually break their sternoclavicular joint, like they, they're usually not going to make it. Um, and so this is why we will have shoulder dislocations and um, shoulder, uh, I can't think of the opposite word of dislocation. Um, <laughs> a dislocation is when you go back and like you dislocated it, right? Popped out, right? So the separation. Separation is where you landed on. There is a clear differentiation. Um it's actually really important to probably be able to know that just from a client standpoint. Someone's like, yeah, well, I dislocated my shoulder. I'm like, how'd you do it? Well, I like fell on it. Oh, you dislocated or you separate it? Cause that's, it's a different aspect of the joint. And then you still want to refer out, but one is going to be the AC joint. One's going to be the glenohumeral joint. So they're different. So the treatments are going to be different. So what you need to like check and prescribe is going to be different, which means refer out. Um, so side tangent, but anyways, because these things will all break and or dislocate first. And that's what we want. I'm like, I'd rather ruin my shoulder than it come in and snap here. And it's because this is so rigid and firm that anything else breaks. And if that doesn't happen, what do you break? It happens all the time with little kids and stuff like that because their arms are so mobile, the clavicle, right? The clavicle will break, right? And so that's okay. So it's just important to know, like this is really strong, really stable. This is a good thing. And then you've got your sternum and you run on down to your xiphoid process, that little aspect right there. And the reason I feel like this is important, this is called your infrasternal angle. This is the angle of your actual lower rib cage. And in, when you breathe in, it should be able to move out, which is why there is so much of these costal fiber connections that are happening lower with those ribs. So notice there's not much up here really hard to breathe and open up your chest right we try but the more we go lower the more the ribs can expand and that's what we want to be able to do which is why like this stuff is able to do so all the way down to the point where we just have floating ribs um that aren't even attached to anything but we still want as much protection around our very valuable little organs that we possibly can have right um and so it's just good to note where somebody is at are they like stuck in exhalation do they have a really wide infrasternal angle that's going to change the way we prescribe some exercises or they have a really shallow one. And it's just something to look at. Like, where are they on that perspective? We don't need to get into the nitty gritty of it other than that. Okay. So we got clavicle runs on out, right? And then you have your um, AC joint. So your acromial clavicle joint, right? And that's just where your acromion is the very apex of that aspect of the clavicle and where the, um, scapula are going to be going to be up at that top part right and so it's just really helpful actually this is a good example so you've got your clavicle here right you've got your chromium and then you've got the top part of your scapula that runs along so you've got this kind of shelf of the scap on the back side and then this shelf on the front side even though the shelf of the back side is at an angle um of your your clavicle and it's where they meet right and so that's the one that can easily get a separation um, that happens when you land on it. Whereas your guinohumeral joint, you can dislocate, your shoulder comes out of its socket. And so I feel like that's just important to be able to kind of know. Um, so your glenohumeral joint is obviously where the glenoid 
meets the humerus, the arm, right? Um, and then you've got those that are going in and you've got your shoulder blade, which is your scapula. And you've got your scapula thoracic joint, your S. Uh, T joint on this backside. So a lot of times you'll just hear SC, AJ, and your, you know, glenohumeral joint, um, you know, GI joint on here. And so your scap needs to be able to slide, but it does have an actual joint. It's just not going to be talked about very often, and that's okay. But what we want to talk about, what we care about, what we know to know about is scapulohumeral rhythm, right? So your scapula and your humerus have a rhythm together. Yes, they started a band. It's going to be great, right? Um, no, that's just a humorous joke. But ultimately, your shoulder has, it needs to, right? If possible, have 180 degrees of abduction, right? It comes all the way up and around. This is really, really helpful, right? Um, side note, it, I say abduction as often as possible just to make sure that it's heard correctly. But we don't say abdominals, <laughs> abdominals, abduction. These are things that I think about that I don't think anybody else does. Because um, some people are like, no, you have to say abduction. And I'm like, do you? Do you say abdominals? Like, no, I say abdominals. Um, anyways, so the ball and socket, right? So when we're thinking about the actual ball and socket, it moves, this glenohumeral joint moves about two thirds of the way without any assistance, right? It can move to this point. But beyond that, we're actually not moving very much of that ball and socket anymore. The rest is happening from the shoulder blade. So you have your scapula. My hand is my scapula. That's this guy right here. This is my pretend rib cage. This is the back of my rib cage. So my shoulder's going up and then eventually my scapula is like, oh, you need more range, you wanna go higher? I'll take over for you. And it moves the last 60 degrees. So oftentimes people say like, oh yeah, for every two degrees of shoulder abduction, you're getting one degree of scapular upward rotation. Like so that's what the scapula is doing. But ultimately it's not two to one. It's not happening simultaneously. And the reason this is, is important is because now if the client's like, yeah, I have pain all along here. Cool. Well, then now we know it's something to do with the shoulder. But if they get here and now they're getting a lot of pain or they come here and they're getting a lot of pain through this flexion, we're like, cool, we probably, that top two thirds, we probably have more of an issue with your shoulder blade not moving well. Now we're not gonna treat pain, but we can improve the mobility of that shoulder blade with some certain exercise selections, right? And so, and changing the position that we're living in through the, that rib cage, where we are in that position. So it's just good to note how the, that glenohumeral rhythm works for that specific understanding. Is this more of a shoulder blade issue as to why they can't get overhead? Usually, right? So if someone's stuck here, like pull your shoulders down and try and raise your arms up by your ears. You can't do it. So if that's where somebody's living, well, wouldn't it be better for us to try and get them back into a place of inhalation? <laughs> Right, get them here and we're like feeling strong. We're like, oh man, and we're like, boom, look at that. My arms came back, I can move again. Great, awesome, cool. Let's keep going on some muscles. Otherwise I'll keep you here all day and all night. So <clears throat> latissimus dorsi, lat, big old lat. You can see this giant, giant muscle. We absolutely love it. It's a huge fan. We're a huge fan of this huge fan. Um, and it wraps all the way around. So we talked about how it goes into that lumbothoracic fascia. You can see that lumbothoracic fascia here is a phenomenal view in this picture, which is great. And you can see it goes all the way down into the pelvis, into the sacral area of the pelvis, attaches to the actual top of the ilium, the iliacus there. So this is beautiful, right, for us to see from this image standpoint, all those muscle fibers. And you can see that it wraps all the way around and attach, attaches into the actual bicipital groove of the humerus, which just means the the aspect of the humerus on the inside of the arm, because what is its job? Its main action is to be a glenohumeral depressor. So its job, glenohumeral, like the actual glenohumeral joint, right? Its job is to depress the arm and AD, adduct, so bringing it towards the midline of the body and internally rotate the humerus. But this is where it's kind of fun because you can see it. So you're going to do pull-ups. There you go, right? But if you come too far, 
right? So now I'm here. So I'm, it's, I'm going through glenohumeral depression. I'm adducting. I'm adducting. I'm going through internal rotation. But then if I go too far, my lat is going to now externally rotate my shoulder if it goes past midline of the body. And so this is why we want to be highly aware when we're training the lat, you know, where is the elbow? Where is the shoulder moving in space for this individual? A lot of that has to do with their rib cage, but a lot of it just has to do with looking and seeing like if their shoulder is now starting to dump forward, if their shoulder is starting to dump into the back pocket and they're actually like hyperextending through their back or if their elbow is starting to now wing in order to get there. Because yes, we can come here and we're using some of that lat if we're trying to be an Olympic weightlifter. But if we're not trying to do that, we don't need that ability. It's okay. So when we're training the lat, we can now realize, okay, so the lat is going to work from a horizontal perspective because look at these horizontal fibers. Then look at these very vertical fibers, right? So there's a lot of different movements, but you notice they sweep around and then they become more horizontal again at the base, which is why it's not that we're going to do pull-ups like this without being able to come in. That last aspect is to pull back underneath because that arm needs to adduct towards the actual body line, right? Cool. So we now understand what its action is. We understand that when we're doing it, it's got to stay close. But when we're keeping the elbow too close to the body, so say I'm doing a row, right? If I keep that elbow too close to the body, my shoulder, my glenohumeral joint, because the lat is an internal rotator, is going to overly internally rotate the shoulder and it's going to dump forward. This can now become problematic because that's a very small cavity of space and I could impinge on something, something that's running through the AC joint, something that is running near along the actual um, glenohumeral joint, right? And so the last thing I want to do is cause pain. I want to build my lats, right? I also don't want it to become an actual complete internal rotation and lift on up. And then I'm not training my lats at all. Now I'm really just trying to train a little bit of rear delt more than anything else. Lost the exercise. So if I keep my elbows slightly off the body and feel those lats as they come around my body, getting that nice deep low squeeze, I'm going to be training lat all the way through. And that's why I really want to say when I'm training lat, I'm pretty much stopping at midline with the body with my elbow. This is going to be my end range position for most people. Okay. This is just good to note. It's also good to note then thinking of the rib cage, thinking of the shoulder position that we just saw, right? If I go through a test and I'm like, raise your arm as high as you can, and this is as high as they can go. Well, then do you think putting them on a vertical position lap pull down machine is going to be possible? They're going to be like this forced. And it means they're going to come here and they're going to push over. They're going to push over. I'm not getting any lat here anymore. I'm pretty much turning it into a tricep push down. So I'm all dealt of some sort and getting some triceps. That's not beneficial. Mostly grip strength is going to be taxed on here more than anything else. So if somebody has a narrow rib cage or forward rounder shoulder position, they live in this kyphosis, I want them to lean back. That's okay. They're seated. They're stable, right? I've taken the stabilization out of it being needed with external forces, a seat on the actual lap pull down. And now they can pull directly to here because for someone with a really rounded shoulder position is going to get a ton of lat here because the lats are already up and stretched. Remember, they attach to the inside of that actual bicipital groove of the humerus. So therefore, their lats are already stretched. The same way our bench press analogy, our short arm, big exhale inhalation guy, he's already stretched his pecs. And so we need them to actually just pull to here, but lean back so that it's in a comfortable position. And as they're doing so, then they come in, they can get a little bit more reach and a little bit more stretch and a little bit more reach and a little bit more stretch. We go through several other exercises, confound that all together, and we may be able to then hopefully get them all the way back up and overhead and doing it properly. So it's finding the right movement and putting it in the right position for the right person, but they all can be right. It's just figuring out based on what you're seeing, what looks and feels right to make sure. And this is why this is just fun to learn and understand. So we just talked about the lat pull down and how you would position somebody like that, right? The beauty was that they were stabilized by the bench. So they didn't have to live in hyperextension to do said move. So therefore they didn't need to rely on any of their glutes or any of the lower musculature, their, their psoas to stabilize their spine. 
Cool. Does that make sense? Hopefully it does. Because if we flip the exercise and we're doing a lower body exercise, like an RDL or any of these moves, what do you think the focus of the lats are? The lats go into all of this thoracolumbar fascia. That's why we were making such a big deal about this. It is designed. Your lats are the only piece that is movable and changeable. Thoracolumbar fascia, you cannot change. You cannot grow its strength size, right? Yes, you can increase some tension capacity. It's not going to grow like the lat is as a muscle. So its main job is to stabilize the spine when you are hinged over or when your body is rotating. Its job is not to allow you to rotate more than you need to. So when you're doing a bent over RDL or a bent over row, your lat's main function is to stabilize your spine. Again, their action is to pull toward insertion to origin, but their function is for stabilization. So when we are training a client that has low back pain, we want to slowly get them in. If we're training an older client, I'm going to have them do a three-point row. And then eventually I'm going to take that point of contact away or go split stance and then take that point of contact away. Yes, it's because I'm like, oh, it's great. We're doing a row. This is good for you. I'm also training with the key intent of function of the lat, which is stabilizing the lower aspect of the spine and more crucially, the pelvis, right? To not go into any type of weird position. So the stronger I make my lats in this position to do their job of functioning, the better that client is going to be. They're not going to experience the same level of low back pain because now they are stabilized to function through those pieces, right? It's fun to note, just a few other pieces, it, uh, it attaches all along that aspect of the rib cage, rib cage T7 through the T12. Um, and that if you think about like your thoracic spine's main job, right, is to create most of your rotation where your lumbar is not. That's why it's connected into almost all of the aspects of your thoracic spine, because then its function is to not let you rotate as the rib cage is meant to rotate through the thoracic spine. Thoracic spine rotate, flat connects to it, so it can help it not rotate when it's not supposed to. Hope that makes sense. And then it connects into the iliac crest, which is why it stabilizes the pelvis. Said all the same things multiple times, I apologize. All right, let's get into the rhomboids. <clears throat> I love these little dudes. The rhomboids, right? They just uh, retract and elevate the scapula. Yes, I know the scapula has four different movement patterns that they go through, but people try and segment them. So you really only need to remember as a trainer that your scapula upwardly rotates and downwardly rotates, right? It's either going through upward rotation or downward rotation. And you can see I exaggerate, but it's really like this sliding and rotating position. That's what it needs to do. And so you can see where we have these wonderful rhomboids, where we have more of the minor up top and the major on the bottom, where they literally connect from spine directly to scap. And so they are going to do a great job of being able to help us upwardly rotate to be able to squeeze on up and through. So oftentimes a client that has these rounded shoulders, they can't do that, right? And so this is a great ability to get us into a position where we can do that. Or if they're already stuck here, sweet, let's do some type of bent over shrug. People are like, shrugs are bad for you there. We don't want to train that position into your neck. That client's not in that position. I mean, like from here, we can literally drive those rhomboids to teach that shoulder blade how to actually start to move on the rib cage again. We can actually make it stronger so we're not actually stuck up in that position, okay? So this is kind of a beautiful thing because it goes from C7 to T1, this little spinous, uh, this little minor, and the major goes from T2 to T5, right? And then you got your lats to pick up down here on T7. So it's just running along this medial aspect, the scap, I'm pulling it up into upper rotation more than anything else, just a beautiful thing, right? So, and retract, retraction and elevation. Um, and so it's doing these two combinated combined moves combinated uh and and its main function right its main function is to stabilize on the rib cage so right when that scap is going into upward rotation counter to what it's trying to do the rhomboid is trying to keep it into retraction but still allows elevation but when the scap is trying to go into upward rotation right the main function of the rhomboid is to stabilize it because if it's not stable, right, that shoulder is going to go somewhere and we're going to have major issues. So the beauty is paying attention 
to the muscle fiber orientation, knowing that it attaches to this side of the scap. Keep that in your brain. We'll come back. But now look at this. The serratus interior. Serratus interior. So we got all of these muscles that originate on the rib cage, the first eight ribs, come all the way up and around. And guess where they insert? Medial aspect. So on the inside of this guy, of that scapula. So they are almost in opposition. They kind of wrap around. Imagine that scap's just in between. So these two things are opposing forces. One pulls that scap this way. One pulls that scap this way. So while one is making it move in a direction to slide up and around the rib cage, the other one is stabilizing it, which is why I absolutely love exercises that allow, take a landmine, you to reach. Because now my serratus anterior is helping me get this nice and forward. Well, it's pulling my shoulder blade around my rib cage, right? My tricep is helping me and my pecs are helping me to do the actual push. All muscles pull though. So that's why I say push this bar forward, but my serratus interior is helping me pull my shoulder blade around. So from here to here, this is all serratus interior. My elbow's not bending. This is how that shoulder blade is sliding around. My serratus interior is pulling this forward. This is beautiful which means my rhomboid has to stabilize. So I need both for this winged type little piece to stabilize as much as possible, right? Last thing to kind of note about the wonderful serratus anterior is it attaches to the upper eight ribs. It says nine here. I've never known of anything that says nine. So I apologize. It's just the image that I have that was really, really good to be able to see what it looks like. Most of these images are, are hard to find that are good. Um, but we notice that it attaches to the upper eight ribs right? When we get into the uh, obliques, we'll note that the external obliques attach to the lower eight ribs. And so just pay attention to that. And I'll, I'll cue you on that in a second. If you're like, upper eight, lower eight. Wait a minute. We only have, we only have 12. We don't have 16. Wait, this doesn't make sense. But that's kind of crucial to note because they can act in opposite ways to help flex the trunk. The external obliques help flex the trunk, right? And so it's just important to note because the serratus anterior can't do, it, do its job to stabilize the scap when, when it's going through retraction. If we are retraction and elevation, if we are stuck in exhalation, right? So if we, uh, I'm sorry, if we are stuck in inhalation. So if I am presenting this major rib flare, my ribs are flaring, I'm stuck in inhalation, I have a really wide infasternal angle, right? Now, no matter what, my external obliques, they're working so hard to try and pull my ribs down, but they can't, right? So now my serratus anterior is almost sh shortened by being in this position because my shoulder blades are pulled down and back. So my rhomboids can't do anything, right? Like they can barely pull because there's no motion. Um, my serratus anterior can't stabilize my scap. So then when I go to do anything overhead because I'm in this position, that can't do its job to stabilize me. And that's just crucial to note. So we want to train clients like that to get their external obliques as tight and as strong as possible to be able to then flex the rib cage on down, right? Because that's their main goal is to flex the trunk. And you also need to be able to flex the rib cage on down through position, right? So I know I'm brushing over some higher level 202 stuff, but I, I still think it's helpful. All right, so let's go back to our wonderful pec. You can see here, yes, there's upper, lower, middle, but ultimately it's just the fact, and, and this is the reason, it, it's it's insertion point uh, being on the glenohumeral head, right? So it's the intertubular humeral groove, which is just the bicipital groove. So just say it, the, please don't ever be that person that like says it all like this. I'm just giving you this, you have this. Just say it attaches to my arm <laughs> so, I, so I can pull my arm in. Like that's its main job, right? Is to help flex and, uh, you know, AD duct, like bring towards the center um, and internally rotate the shoulder. Wait, 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 wait. think about all those things. That, that's pretty much um, pretty close to everything that the lot does. Maybe because it touches at the same point because they pretty much kind of do those similar things, right? Okay, cool. So a few differences there, but kind of kind of neat um, that they work in conjunction a lot of times. So if you have a client that wants to actually get really good at pull-ups, you better have them doing some form of dips 
j just when you look at the insertion points. Again, that's higher level. I won't go into it. Um, but their plan better have dips of some sort if you want them to get better at pull-ups um, or achieve a first one, right? So anyways, your origins, you've got them all the way up into the clavicular head, attached into your actual clavicle, which is why sometimes people will do these upward position ones, right? To try and target that aspect of the chest. And then it attaches all the way down into the actual sternum. Oops. And then running along that aspect of the rib cage that kind of pulls on down. So, um, and you've got pec minor over here, just good to kind of know. A lot of times that guy gets really short and tight when the shoulders are rounded. So if you can break up some scar tissue, cause you actually have these, you know, actual, um, tendon pieces like that actually can help. Uh, so for a lot of people that's more of PT thing. Um, but it's main function, right. It's to just stabilize the arm through extension and through external rotation. So like when you're back here in this position where you're reaching to grab the bottle from the back seat of your kid's car, your pec is kind of important. So oftentimes people are like, well, I don't really want to get big packs or like, I just, I just want to get like a little bit stronger and like, I want to feel better. Let's train the pecs, like dead serious. Because when you're going here, like I don't want that arm to have an issue. I don't want you to have a shoulder dislocation. So I want to actually make your pecs stronger right? I can't prevent a separation like happening at that AC joint if you land on things or a clavicle breaking if you get tackled playing, you know, pick up football. But I can hopefully decrease the chance of a shoulder dislocation because we have trained your pecs, right? But it is also because I have trained your deltoids. Okay, so when it comes to the deltoids, we've got pretty much every you know, action that you want to go with because it's based on the glenohumeral hemorrhoid train, right? Like, and so that shoulder can go wherever it wants to go. And so you've got a front aspect of the delt, you've got a medial aspect of the delt and you've got a rear aspect of the delt. Here's what's fun. Let's talk about the glute. Very similar. Looks similar. Performs similar. The hip, the shoulder. Very similar. Ball and socket. We have a glute med. Very similar to the delt med. But we do glute med raises, glute med kickouts, glute med, glute med, glute med. But we don't do delt med raises. We do delt lateral raises. It's another one of these things. I don't know why I'm telling you and wasting your time. I just don't understand it. That's all. That's just bringing that to the table. Um, so we, we've got, we're going to call them lateral raises, even though it's it's the medial head, uh, the medial aspect of the delt, right? So <clears throat> just fun thing to note. So what is its main function? It, the, the delt's main function is the most important piece to know is superior translator of the humerus. So superior translator of the humerus is its main function. Its main function is to oppose the lat. The lat comes up and around, catches in the bicipital groove of the humerus and wants to pull the arm towards itself, pull it down, right? That's the lat's main job. The delt's main job is to pull it up. If we just strengthen our lats too much, strengthen our lats too much, we'd actually get this depressed shoulder position. If we don't train our delts, we may actually have some kind of issue with the ability to suck that shoulder into place. That's the delt's main job. Suck that shoulder into place and keep it nice and tight and nice and safe. It's why we say go grab a heavy pair of kettlebells and just go for a farmer's walk. People are like, oh, but that's like just training my grip. It trains your grip. You're like, oh, but it's just training my upper traps. Yes, it trains your traps. Oh, that's training my transverse abdominus so that I'm not rotating, right? Well, yes, it does that. It's training your arms to get strong as hell so that when you pick up a million groceries, you pick up the baby in the baby carry, you pick up suitcases, you pick up all these things all day long, you don't have a shoulder dislocation. It actually sucks the humerus into place. It pulls it in nice and tight. So if you have shoulder issues, right, and we just need to teach a lot of stabilization, what is probably one of the best things to do? Carry something heavy. It's why we'll do bottoms up kettlebell presses. Think about that. You grip so tight and you pull in so tight because you're worried that kettlebell is going to fall. That's the mental deception that is going through. And when you're doing that, you are translating superiorly the humerus head into the glenoid and you are just simply creating stabilization, the main function of the deltoid. Beautiful aspect, right? We can grow it with some delt raises. We can grow it and do many different things in that regard. But as far as its main function, that's what we're trying to go for, right? 
So hopefully that was helpful. Um, it is, it's good to note, like it does attach to the clavicle. It does attach to the chromium that we were just talking about. And it does attach to the spine of the scap. So we are getting many different aspects of where we are creating that ability, right? To create stabilization through the actual shoulder. Okay, cool. Well, hope this was helpful. Anatomy 101 for upper body. And um, in future lessons, we can go deeper into rib cage, into diaphragm, into breathing, um, into the neck, um, into the rotator cuff, which I, I think is helpful. Um, actually, last little piece on delts. Bring you back. Bring you back in. Um, those that are doing lean away delt raises, right? So we can read here for the muscle action is from 15 degrees to 120 degrees is where we are getting more of the medial head more than anything else through abduction of that delt, which means down here, we're not getting very much. What are we getting? Getting more than anything else, supraspinatus, which is the top aspect of your rotator cuff, okay? So you've got supraspinatus on top, super, superior on top. You've got infraspinatus, inferior, so slightly belower, so lower, slightly below, You've got teres minor coming up underneath and then in between your shoulder blade and your rib cage that helps suck that thing down and you've got sub scapular, sub, right? Teres minor is this little minor guy down underneath and then you have teres major, this big guy, he's not one of your rotator cuffs really, but it's, uh, you know, because the main four, sorry, my dog's hitting the door here, but you've got your teres major, which is a different aspect to do different things with the shoulder. So if I put myself in a lean away position, now I've just taken this 15 degrees that was all by supersternatus and now I've just made it even bigger. Do I really need to strengthen that aspect? Not necessarily, the rotator cuff's whole job is to stabilize the actual cuff, right? Um, so we don't need to actually move it through that position. We're gonna be better off with the cable being nice and smooth here, right? Or even a lean away, lean into and be with a bench. So we can actually get that aspect of the delt unless we are trying to overload the position through the eccentric, right? So if I'm trying to use this, this lean away position to swing the arm, right, with a dumbbell, as long as it's safe for me, and then control the eccentric position, right? Because this, if I am here, would be my 120 degrees. And so I'm gonna go from my 120 degrees on down to about 30 before it just drops out, right? But if I can strengthen it through the eccentric through that part, then I might be able to actually build up more traditionally here. But it's important to note that a lean away with a cable doesn't make any sense, but a lean away with a dumbbell for eccentric purposes does. Whereas a traditional cable is perfect for that entire range of motion. Whereas down here, that dumbbell is not gonna get very, very much where I want tension all the way through, especially if the cable is here. So if I just look at my fulcrum and my line of pull, hopefully that helps you. So you can have some nice, strong, stable shoulders and just pick up some kettlebells and go for a walk. All right, Anatomy 101, upper body, finally complete. Thanks for listening. If you have any questions, you know how to find me and um, we'll go from there.